Good morning, everybody. Let us know, please, in the chat box if you have any issues uh, with connectivity or with uh, my speakers. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Raimondi. I am with the Global Employment Initiative. And thank you very much for participating with us today in this first session of the GEI webinar series featuring EFM entrepreneurs. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, the idea for this webinar series came about as a result of the increasing interest in entrepreneurship among the EFM community. There are many, many amazing EFMs around the globe who have pursued self-employment in many forms and within many industries. And we developed this webinar to share their tips and best practices with others considering a similar path. So we'll be hearing from three panelists today, all work within the professional services sector, but in different areas. And so they'll bring a different and unique perspective regarding their challenges and the development of their businesses. So each participant has a brief presentation, which will be followed by time for questions and answers. So please type your questions in the chat box and we'll track them and ask uh, questions of the participants after each of them has uh, finished with their part of the presentation. So first, we're going to hear from Christine this morning. Christine Alcea Mendojana is a certified public accountant and a certified financial planning professional. She holds an undergraduate degree in accounting and an MS in foreign service and business diplomacy. During her 25 plus year career, she's worked in the professional services firms of KPMG, Arthur Anderson and Capital One. And she's a founding managing member of Brenner and Alcea Mendojana LLC. She started her tax and financial planning business in 2006 and merged it into Brenner and Alcea Mendojana LLC in 2011. She's been in EFM since 2000 and has served with her foreign service spouse in the Philippines, Portugal, Peru, Colombia, DC, and is currently in Barcelona, Spain. So I'll turn it over to Christine. Uh, she'll go through her presentation. And um, then as I mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A. So please type your questions in the chat box as she's talking and we will ask those questions of her during the question portion. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna start my webcam just for the initial part just so that I can see you and then I'll turn it off so that I don't mess up anybody's bandwidth. Um, so thank you for having me on. I'm excited to talk to everyone interested in being an EFM entrepreneur. Just to give you a very brief background, I'm going to go through my slides fairly quickly because I want to focus most of my time on my last slide because I have some tips on the mechanics of actually starting a EFM entrepreneurial business that I wanted to share with you. So a brief background on why I started my business. Um, my spouse and I, we graduated from Georgetown School of Foreign Service together. He joined the State Department. I joined Dr. Anderson with the promise to move my career with Anderson as my spouse moved with the State Department. And that worked brilliantly from DC to Manila, and I was in the process of finishing my negotiations to move to the Lisbon office, and Enron hit and the whole, whole firm went under. And so I ended up moving to uh, Portugal without a career. And um, I was lucky at that time actually to, have, to be pregnant with my first child, and so it gave me time to really think about what it is that I wanted to do um, for the next stage. And a long story short, I decided over the next several years to take the five classes necessary to sit for the Certified Financial Planners exam. Um, I had another child. And I um, realized that you know, I love tax, I love financial planning, I love accounting. Um, and there seemed to be a real need in the US expat community, particularly in the US government, community for professionals with um, who understood the unique needs as it related to tax and financial planning in that community. And so um, I decided that was where I wanted the next stage of my career to go was to help in that area. So I started my business in 2006. We were still in the DC area at the time, but our next assignment was Lima, Peru. And the, the biggest hesitation or um, feedback that I got when I had my idea and I started on that planning process was from other professionals who were unsure that, um, that clients would be interested in obtaining sophisticated tax services in a remote online environment. Because in order for this business plan to work, it needed to be able to reach people all over the world. 
world because everybody's always moving to fix it. And um, thankfully, I was able to navigate around that issue and um, and problem solve around it. So it hasn't been an issue in the long term. At the same time as I was building my business, the internet was taking off, and more and more options were available, and more security was available. And so we were able to take advantage of those tools at the same time. Um, sorry, I didn't even move the slide over. So the biggest challenge that I face since I started is really um, hiring. Uh, and recently we discovered a, um, a new firm called Serving Talent that focuses on EFMs, a lot of military, some um, department, other firms, and we've been able to source some great candidates from there. But my goal when I started this was to grow it and to, to end up hiring EFMs along the way. I wanted to broaden the EFM family and providing these services. And that's been a challenge, finding um, finding qualified candidates. And so, like I said, we found this firm and, and we found some great candidates from there. So we're always on the lookout for qualified candidates, um, and that has been my biggest challenge. The most rewarding part of my self-employment time is really um, the positive impact that um, I like to feel like we bring to our clients. So um, the ability to help them when it's you know it's difficult because you're moving and um, the, the issues are difficult and the logistics are difficult and so really trying to, to help the client navigate those difficulties and make it less stressful um, and it also provides me with a great flexible work schedule um, I can manage my family I can manage me um, and I also love the constant intellectual challenge for continuously changing work environment. So I never, I never get tired. There's always something new to learn. Um, what resources have I found most helpful in the area of my business? Um, it's really my professional society. And um, so for me, being a CPA and a CFP, I have a lot of access to professional society. Um, other industries you know, are going to have their own, their own types of groups that maybe you can network into. The AICPA, the Virginia Society of CPAs, the um, Certified Financial Planning Board, they have fantastic web-based training, um, and they even have access to other professionals online. We have a very, very active um, kind of group in the Virginia Society of CPAs where you can network with other professionals and ask um, complicated tax questions and, and get resources and so forth. So that's been fantastic. And what is the one thing that I would suggest to other EFMs as they start their business? I gave you a couple of them. Um, be willing to start small and grow slowly. A lot of these businesses, I mean, sometimes you can hit the ground running and you know, be great the first year forward, but a lot of them, it takes time to grow it. We want to grow it on a solid foundation. Um, because if you go too quickly sometimes and the foundation isn't solid, then the growth isn't sustainable. So be willing you know, to look at your business and see what makes the most sense. Persevere, don't give up, always problem solve. Always have a mindset of overcoming the hurdles and the problem solving. And then really keep current in your field, not just in the technical side, which is obviously essential, but also from um, the tools and the resources that are available. And that's something in our business is we're constantly looking at um, what new security options are out there, what new tools are out there, how can we make it better, how can we deliver our product better in a more secure and so you want to stay current with what works. All right, so I want to spend the majority of my time here. Um, tips on getting started. As, uh, as I said during the introduction, I started the business when we were li living in the DC area and moved it to Lima. I moved it to Bogota, Colombia. I moved it back to DC. I moved it to Spain. And this summer, I'm going to move it back to DC. And then I'm going to move it to Ankara, Turkey. And it's totally fine to do that. Um, the first thing you always want to do when you have any kind of business, I'm going to focus on self-employment. Obviously, there are some other issues if you're working in the local economy. I'm not going to discuss those. Um, but in terms of self-employment, you have to have a master level. I have a standard memo that I use, and I update it. You want to talk to your um, your admin counselor to find out what the right who the right people are and what the right mechanism is to get that memo to the ambassador. Usually, it has to go through a couple of people. And the ambassador to ultimately sign. You need to look at the bilateral and right to work agreement that might be or right to work agreement that might be signed with your host country. So 
make sure that you understand those provisions. The parole office can, can help you with that. Um, the biggest thing that um, in my situation is I do not ever work with clients in the local economy. I do nothing in the local economy. My business doesn't exist in any capacity in the local economy. Um, I can work with commission employees because the ambassador approves that, but I do nothing else. I don't, I don't um, hire services and I don't deliver services. Um, and the reason is, is that if you do that, you may have to register as a business in that host country. Um, and when you register as a business as a host country, you have to follow whatever their rules are. And in the US, it's really easy to start a business. You know, register with your state and get a business license and then start giving out services and pay your taxes and you're basically good. That's not the way it is in a lot of countries. Um, in some agreements, you're not even allowed to start a business as an ESM. Um, and in the countries that would allow it, you have to follow all these and it's not maybe worth it to do that when you're only there a few years. In addition, you have to follow all the local tax um, rules, and you have to pay all the local taxes in some starting a business in that country. So I think that's really important if you want to understand what your business is, and you want to make sure you're following those agreements, um, and you're not triggering issues with local registration, local tax, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of uh, telecommuting, I think it's the, the easiest way to do it. And in most cases, if you're telecommuting straight out into your company and you're not doing anything in your local host country, that's usually the cleanest way and you're not going to be triggering um, taxes and so forth. Entity selection is a very complicated issue. I want to bring it up because I think it's something to really consider. And I don't have time to go through all of that in this presentation, but there are various um, ways to organize. Um, basically, this, you know, you've all probably heard the new tax law. Sole proprietor, LLC, and S Corp um, basically cover one area of the new tax law. S Corp is another area. But sole proprietor, LLC, and S Corp, the taxes are going to be the same in tax. Um, what you want to look at are legal liability, and you want to look at um, kind of the issue of telecommuting and what's the cleanest way to do that and so forth. And also, if you have partners or if you're working by yourself. You need to look at insurance um, and make sure that you have adequate insurance for whatever it is that you're actually doing. And then you need to consider your U.S. state for federal tax issues. Um, so especially if you are have an LLC or a C Corp, you're going to have it registered in the U.S. and you're going to have state uh, tax issues with that. If you're a sole proprietor, you're going to have tax issues with that. So again, those are more complicated than what I can go through this presentation. but I want to flag them to make sure that I have a place to do them. And then, of course, your web presence. Everyone needs a web presence. Um, you need to watch your reputation, obviously, and how you use social media. And you need to, to be careful with that, too, in terms of making sure that you're complying um, in your host country and that your web presence and your social media accounts aren't doing anything that might make it difficult for you being an EFM in your host country, in addition to committing doing something positive to promote your business. So to grow, obviously, advertising, looking for um, ways to advertise that are within the community that you're looking to get clients in, um, finding qualified employees if you wish to grow. And you need to be careful. You're not going to be able to hire people in your host country, most likely. Um, and you're most likely going to be able to hire people in your host country with a lot of different Situations, but for the most part, you wouldn't. You would probably hire somebody outside of that. Um, and so, looking at the legal implications and tax implications for that. Um, and again, hiring considerations with the federal and state tax uh, obligations. Okay, so I think that's my allotted time, but um, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, Christine, thank you very much. This is Kim. Uh, if you could all just bear with us for a moment, we have. Um, a small technical difficulty, which we're going to try to resolve right now. I understand a couple people are having problems with the audio. Uh, so just give us a minute to try to resolve that. And we'll also get a chat box that you can all um, type your questions into. In the meantime, Christine, I did have a couple follow-up questions for you. Um, I believe that you've used the Professional Development Fellowship at various times throughout your career. So I wanted to ask you to just uh, for you to share a bit 
with the um, people listening to when you use that, how you used it, how it helped you in your career uh, going forward over the, the years that you took advantage of that program. Sorry, I'm not sure if someone's asked me a question, but I can't hear anything. So, sorry, okay, and, and for everyone who didn't hear me, bear with us. We have uh, attendees and hosts and presenters calling in from just dozens of countries, and sometimes it leads to a couple bandwidth issues, which we're trying to resolve. But yes, I was asking you about how you use the professional development fellowship throughout your career. Right. Um, and the question was, how have you used the professional development throughout your career? Um, and I apologize, I meant to bring up the fact that uh, when I first moved to Lima, I um, met a couple of EFMs who were working in the SNAP office, which was pretty slow um, at that time, and they were fantastic. And they, they told me about the professional development uh, fellowship that's still actually available. And I was able to apply for that and um, use those funds to pay for a review class before I sat for the certified financial planners exam. And it also helped to pay some of the costs of actually flying to the U.S. and taking the exam. So that was a um, that was a fantastic fellowship. Okay, great. And you talked early on about growing slowly. Um, how did this play out for you during the first couple of years of your business? Um, and what were the advantages of that? Okay, it seems like we're having a couple technical difficulties with Christine. I don't know if she could hear my question. Um, Christine, let us know if you have audio. Um, if not, we can move on. It seems like um, we may be having an issue. It seems like the chat box, though, is up and running. So you can type your questions in there um, for Christine and for the uh, following presenters. Um, and we will track the chat box and read them out to the presenters as we're ready to move forward. Okay, great. So I think we'll we'll move on to Luce's portion of the presentation. Um, and so to give a brief intro to Luce. Luce Weinberg is a Miami-based former municipal elected official and governor-appointed state transportation official who turned her political, public relations, and communications career into Globecom LLC a construction communications consultant firm. She resides with her husband in Bogota, while her three children and, client, and her clients are located in Miami, Florida. So, Luce, if you could uh, just walk us through um, these questions and give us a sense for your background and how you've approached your business and business development, that would be fantastic. fantastic. Sure. Hi. Good morning, everyone. And. Uh, Thank you, Christine, for that uh, wonderful information. Um, some of what you shared, I uh, actually had to look up myself on, online or utilize some very good uh, friends and family uh, who can do tremendous resources. Uh, good morning. So my name is Luz Weinberg. I'm going to go through each of the slides, specific questions, and uh, then share uh, some of the key suggestions and advice that I would have for uh, for our EFMs that have helped me thus far. So as um, Somebody mentioned I have this substantial uh, history with politics and, and uh, professional career in, in construction uh, through communications and PR, yet here I found myself uh, having my husband tell me that we were moving to Bogota, Colombia, um, at, while I was still at the hype of my political career. So it was not a question of um, hesitating at all. Uh, my biggest hesitation uh, didn't last very long because necessity is the mother of invention, as everyone knows. So uh, with the announcement that uh, my husband made, it was time for me to do something. So the fear that I felt at that moment had to translate into actions. And uh, what I did was while we were in D.C. doing our, our training up to prepare for uh, the diplomatic post, I went online 
searched up, uh, how to set up my LLC, um, set up my website uh, after I picked the name, wrote out all the uh, content of my website. And before we were leaving DC and packing our bags to move to Bogota, Colombia, I already had set up a consulting firm. Uh, but there were still a lot of uh, holes to plug um, in terms of exactly what is it that I am going to do. I have all this information and, and knowledge and skill set, but I've always utilized it as an employee. I had uh, my first job when I was 14 years old at the food court of a mall, and I have never not worked since then. It was 30 full years of employment with someone else. I had no idea what it was like to be employed uh, for myself and to have clients rather than uh, bosses and people I, I served. So I set up my consulting firm and we packed our bags and moved to Bogota and uh, hope for the best. Um, let me uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, it's working. So uh, the biggest challenge I faced then once I did land a client, a construction uh, client back in Miami, not in Bogota, the employment uh, in the Colombian marketplace was very scarce. I sent tens and tens and tens of applications, not even a call back. The uh, embassy's employee was also scarce. Then the employment freeze came about. So I basically sat at home for about eight months trying to develop what it was that I was going to do with this business and calling up old contacts and uh, letting people know that I was now available um, through that route of consulting base. So the biggest challenge then became once I did get a client uh, one in Miami and one in uh, Northwestern Canada uh, was uh, how do I manage this? I have two clients that are not in the country where my husband is, and uh, my children are in three separate places in Miami. I have a 25 year old, a 23 year old, and a 17 year old, and they're all all over Miami between college and adult uh, lives and, and high school. So that was my hurdle. Um, how do I manage now? How do I split myself three ways? And uh, so time and task management became. Uh, very, very important. And of course, while I'm making those calls, letting uh, friends and family and contacts know that I'm now available, the real challenge is how to make that shift from free to fee. A lot of us have volunteered, and all, probably everyone on this on this chat today, on this webinar, has done some sort of volunteer. So you have all this skill set that you probably never recognize as being a valuable asset to a corporation on a fee base. And, and that's basically what I was doing. Aside from public service, which is a free uh, service as an elected official, my uh, service on the transportation board for the governor, which is also a free service, all that while I'm amassing further skills. I sat on boards of uh, nonprofit organizations, American Cancer Society, World Door, DASPIRA. Uh, so I've done all this work. And with that came a lot of skills that most of us don't ever want to put up. Uh, financial value to it, but guess what? Those organizations you are volunteering for full know, well, they know full well what their value is. So making that shift from free to fee uh, became a real uh, uh, challenge for me. How do I now tell people that I'm charging for what I used to do for them for free? So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, then the most rewarding uh, part, it's another F, I call it my F presentation. Um, it's uh, the freedom, uh, the flexibility that you have of making uh, your own hours. So strangely enough, the most rewarding part of self-employment for me had been the very challenge that it was, the ability to split myself uh, between um, a client in another country in Canada, a client in Miami, my children being in separate places in Miami, um, and my husband being at post in Bogota. How do I fly everywhere and, and, and meet all the demands um, and then further needing to enhance my time and task management skills and being able to rise to, to that challenge and that occasion. So that has been uh, very rewarding as, as it is challenging. It also helps if your mindset is established that way. If we're going to look at controversy and challenge as that, only that, as challenge and controversy, I have found for me professionally and politically, it has worked to not only view it that way. Okay, this is the challenge. This basically sucks. Um, what is it that I can take from this? How can I turn this? How can I spin it? And it has helped that professionally that has been my job in public relations and communications, everything's about how you spin it. You have this major drama come about, some major issue happened on a construction site, something happened, someone got hurt, et cetera, our media's coming. How do I flip this around to be a positive? So if you can train your mind to try to always see 
Okay, the little nugget, golden nugget of positivity and that challenge and that terrible thing that sucks, it can ultimately become very rewarding. And that's what I managed to do. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. And of course, having the support of, of, of my spouse and everyone um, that was impacted by those changes helps. Now, the resources that I found most helpful, don't ever underestimate the power of your friends and your family. And that's exactly who I turned to. While I was online in this hotel room in Washington, D.C., trying to figure out how to set up a corporation and what type of corporation to set up, um, I got on the phone with uh, two former colleagues uh, that I worked for, um, and they gave me advice on setting up my contracts. Uh, they were in construction. I'm going to go now as a consultant in construction. Uh, from our previous vendors that did work for us uh, when I worked for my company, what did those vendors' contracts look like? I need to know the language. How do I even put together this contract? Uh, my baby brother had been in business for himself for about 15 years by then. Uh, he too helped me at that time uh, uh, for tax purposes and accounting. And what type of corporation do I file, et cetera? So friends and family became a big, big and key resource. So that was my, my mentorship. I call them my mentors. I've always mentored people. I've always relied heavily on my mentors, and I had no shame in going back to them and asking for help. And of course, my marketing and PR experience was a big help, because aside from friends and family, the other app that can really help you and resources is Facebook, and I mean social media. So then I took to that, uh, publishing my website with my both my political page and my personal page on Facebook, and letting friends know through the social media memes, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and my own website pushing that, that I am now available and this is my business. Uh, you cannot be embarrassed uh, to brag, uh, if that's the right word. Uh, it kind of can be seen by some, but in public relations, you are just basically selling yourself. You are uh, selling your service. Uh, you cannot be shy about that. So helpful resources, again, become your friends and family and, and your social media. And then if there is one thing I can suggest uh, to our ESMs is be focused. I never lost focus. And there will be days when you arrive at post. Uh, um, and Christine, I applaud you. You've been doing this for so many years now. Um, I've met this only a year and five months at post. Uh, there might be some of our listeners and uh, who have tuned into the webinar who have just got to post. And there will be days where you will be depressed, you will be sad, you will cry, you will say, what am I doing here? Um, especially someone who was like me. I, at one point, I had the city of Aventura where I was an elected official. I had the transportation board I was sitting on. I had both my Port Miami Tunnel project that was being built, the Brickell City Center project in Miami being built, both projects under my belt for stakeholder management, angry people who didn't want that project. I had three, my three kids, and I'm just uh, 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 starting with my awesome old friend, new husband, uh, uh, marriage. So it was insane. And to slam on the brakes, to move to Bogota and basically do nothing uh, for many, many months can be very, very taxing. So the advice I can really give you, the key advice that helped me through was to stay focused. And on those days that I felt like crap and I didn't want to get out of bed and I was probably inconsolable in my mind, thinking, what am I doing? Where do I go from here? Um, I remained that, I kept that focus. This is my, okay, here's my resume. And it wasn't until I sat with Kimberly, actually, who came to Bogota, a very wise woman, as I write. She asked me, what is it exactly that you do? And I had all this information. I did too many things in my career. My mom always tells me, you look like you've lived three lives, not just one. I was into too many things. I have all this skill set. I'm always too busy. I can't say no to people. And Kimberly asked me, what is it that you do? Give me your 30-second elevator pitch. She forced me to really regroup and put together a one-sheet profile. I have a 15-page resume because my resume encompasses all the speaking engagements I have done and, and some of the jobs and the political stuff. But I didn't have a one-sheeter. And she made me put together that one sheet and really, really organized all these thoughts that I had been focusing on into one sheet of paper. And for me, that was huge because here I am a writer and I hadn't written down my one sheet of paper until this one person asked me and put it in context. So never underestimate any conversation, casual as it may sign or, or, or may seem to you, um, never underestimate the value of what that person's casual question might, might uh, end up being for you. 
So I suggest you review your resume very carefully, especially if you're getting ready uh, or if you just arrived at post, see what it is that you have to offer. Uh, like Christine, I have not done anything uh, locally. My clients in Miami, uh, I had to just uh, terminate my Canada clients because my Miami project is just getting underway. Uh, they dug a huge hole in the ground. We're about to go vertical. So I am required more of my time. A lot of my stuff is on the phone or online, but I do get to go home um, and visit the site, but also, most importantly, to see my children. So um, I've had to like really sit down and review what it is, what is it that I'm doing so that I can continue to promote myself. So be your own publicist. Don't ever be embarrassed to promote yourself. There's a great joke among uh, the PR community where when Moses arrives at the Dead Sea, uh, there's all this water and they have nowhere to go and the Egyptians are coming right behind them and they're about to uh, reach them and kill them. Uh, a guy, a publicist, turns to Moses and taps him in the shoulder and says, hey, if you part these waters, I guarantee you at least two pages in the best book ever written. So <laughs> that's my publicist joke for the day. Uh, but don't be afraid to be your own publicist. In any conversation that you encounter, you can work what it is that you have to offer, what it is that your services are, um, uh, what it is that you do, what is it that you build, what is it that you sell into conversation casually. You'd be surprised um, what business can come from it. I think Christine just got herself a new client this morning for me for, uh, on this webinar. So never underestimate that and use social media. Uh, dress for success. I can't emphasize that enough. So, uh, Coco Chanel used to say you dress like a, um, uh, a um, uh, you dress like a beggar and they'll notice the clothes. If you dress like a king, they'll notice you. So always dress for success no matter uh, where you're going. A fur of pearls and some pink red lipstick can go a long way. Um, and utilize your website. And if you uh, need help writing your website, I'll be more than happy uh, to do so. Uh, websites are a, a, a big part of any business. That is where people go to to find out exactly what it is that you're offering. Uh, along, of course, with social media and everything has to tie. And of course, I think at this point, I don't have to emphasize how very critical it is that your social media pages um, are social media pages of someone who is looking to have and retain and uh, obtain business. So no crazy photos and uh, you know what I mean. So maintain your social media is nice and clean. So, um, getting over the fear, uh, you move on to making that shift from free to fee. Um, you, you, you will obtain this incredible freedom and flexibility that is really a joy. Uh, don't undermine your friends and family uh, as real resources uh, to help you through this very difficult time. And keep your focus. Um, never lose sight of that focus. If you're going to be sad one day, be sad one day. It's okay. But then get right back to your focus on what it is that you are looking to do. Um, and I wanted to leave it at that in the event there are uh, questions. That's my um, F presentation on the key five S of success. Taking that fear, turning it from free to fee, obtaining that freedom, utilizing your friends and and family, and keep that focus even uh, with time. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Lou, so much. Such interesting okay. information. So. Anna, I believe, has um, tracked a couple questions from the chat box. Anna, if you're ready for those. Yes, hi, everyone. If you can hear me, just let me know, Kim, to confirm. Perfect. I can hear you perfectly. Thanks. So, Luz, the first question is, how did you make the jump from free to fee? Yeah, and, and that's a difficult one, and especially for us uh, women. We tend to be the doers of all things and um, very quick to say yes when someone asks for a favor. Uh, so my key thing was going to those uh, uh, the resources of folks that I had uh, worked with. Uh, for example, I had a, a vast uh, network of contacts uh, of the vendors that had worked on my two big projects. Um, I prepared a, an email blast that went out to all those contacts, letting them know. And it's basically my profile sheet list. If you look me up on LinkedIn, my profile sheet is public and it's available. It's one sheet, list uh, what I have done, what I have to offer, what my retainer fee is, and what the hourly fee is. So uh, the email blasts are very easy, but then you have to have these un uh, conversations that can be uncomfortable. But once you realize that value, once I had to put on paper, what it is that I have to offer and recognize that, yes, I am worth this, 
and I should be getting paid, then the conversations get a little easier, but I'm not gonna lie. It's uncomfortable for, for us to then all of a sudden now say, I now expect to get paid, uh, but yes, and you don't say that, but you certainly say that you have started your own business and you are now a consultant and this is my hourly fee and I'll be very happy to provide you with those services. Um, there might be negotiations. That's another thing that we moms uh, tend to be bad at outside of the home. Uh, our kids try to negotiate, uh-uh, we win. Um, I don't know about you, but I've raised three and they know there's no uh, getting to three with, when I start counting. I get to one and it's, whatever's happening is done. But somehow when we leave home, it's difficult for us to negotiate. So there will be negotiations. Both my clients had negotiated my terms and I held pretty uh, uh, strong. Uh, my Miami client had to pay what I asked for ultimately. Uh, well, Canada got a little discount because it was a former employer of mine, uh, which is also fine to do. As you start your business, you might find that offering a little bit of discount can uh, of course make you get that client or that new customer. And then with the understanding that eventually, you know, your fee will be your fee. So it is not an easy shift to make, but it's certainly doable. You just have to hold your ground and know and appreciate your own work because then you can't sell it if you don't believe Thank it. Thank you, Luz. You have two more questions. Um, we're gonna try to get through them so we can go to the next presenter and then also have time for Christine's question. The next question was, which social media should you use? What platforms? Okay, I, I believe that really depends on your business. For example, I say consultant and because I've had uh, pages in Twitter, Instagram, uh, well, my Instagram is more personal, but Twitter and Facebook is what I've used uh, for my political pages from years back, and I've maintained that as a consultant. Um, so I think you need to really focus your social media presence on what your business is. For example, if you're uh, selling goods, you're making products, uh, of course, a presence on Facebook is it's ideal. You can post the photos of what it is that you have, that are uh, Instagram, almost everybody, every business I know now has an Instagram account. So those are very good. Uh, Twitter is more for uh, uh, services uh, driven uh, business. So I would really focus and think about what it is that your business is and then see and then peruse around all of those social media sites and see what it is, what are you seeing the most? Uh, what is trending the most? And so if you're seeing goods and services more on Facebook, then perhaps that's the way to go. Great, thank first. you. The last one actually came from several people's requests. Would you mind sharing your elevator pitch with us? Ah, <laughs> that's very good. I think uh, when Kimberly asked me for two or three sentences to describe myself, my 30 second pitch got even uh, shorter. So I'm a former elected official and former governor appointed state transportation official with 30 years of communications and public relations currently serving impact mitigation and stakeholder management for big construction projects. Boom, that's it. <laughs> I think I narrowed it down to 15, Kimberly. Every time you ask me a question, my, my, my pitch gets smaller and smaller, so thank, thank you. Thank you very that. much, Luz. Um, those are the three big questions that we had. And if, for those who wonder what impact mitigation is, with every construction project, someone gets impacted, whether it's the uh, next door neighbor that is getting the dust and noise, uh, or the uh, constant onflow of traffic, because I've closed a lot of roads and there's a lot of road closures that involve construction. So I deal with uh, mitigating those aspects. So if there's dust, then how do we mitigate that dust? Uh, watering, uh, having a, a water truck go around the site every day. If there's noise, I can make those trucks that, um, uh, that have the beeping horn when they're backing up, have the white noise uh, uh, horn instead. Uh, when we're going to close roadway, uh, plenty of anticipated notices, et cetera. So that's what I do is um, how do we, how does the project succeed without getting a bunch of members of the public complaining to City Hall and trying to shut the project down? Um, and so that's what I do. Perfect. Thank meetings. you very much. Those were the top three questions. Thank you. Thank I'll you for pass it over to Kim now. Okay, great. Luz, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, so at this point, we're going to um, move to the third presenter, Morgan. If you did have any questions for Christine, please type them in the chat box and we'll go back to her at the end of Morgan's uh, presentation and make sure that we address everybody's questions. But I wanted to give people a chance to get those into the chat box during the next several minutes. Uh, so right now we'll move to Morgan. 
Um, by way of background, Morgan is a freelance writer, virtual assistant, business coach, and published author. She's followed her husband to Zagreb, Croatia, to serve as their first foreign service post. When she's not working, she enjoys traveling, binge-watching TV shows, and playing with her Westies, Guinness and Jameson. So Morgan, I'll turn it over to you now. We're looking forward to, to hearing about your background. Hi, thank you, Kimberly. I'll just share my um, camera just a second so I can officially say hello to everyone. Hopefully Perfect. you all can see me while it's downloading. Um, thank you for the introduction. My husband and I are at our first post in Zagreb, Croatia. We arrived here in the summer of 2016 and love it. We'll be very sad to leave the summer, but all good things come to an end, unfortunately. Um, if you can see my video, this is one of my coworkers, that's Jameson. If you hear a bark, it's most likely the other coworker, Guinness. So I'll go ahead and stop the video now and continue on. Um, for more than half of my life, I have worked for someone or for some business. So when we found out we were leaving the States, I left my sales job of five years, um, which was really scary for me because I had worked for more than 18 years of my life. Um, there's security in going to work. You do your job and your employer handles the rest. So my biggest hesitation from working for home, from home for myself was having to do everything myself. All of my jobs had been customer driven and there was a progression in my career. So I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to create fulfilling work that was profitable at home. The first thing I did when I got to post was actually get grounded in my new community. I figured as I was trying to build that career, I would just get more comfortable being somewhere completely different. I took post language classes, joined the International Women's Club, worked as an English tutor in the local economy, and then volunteered for the Embassy's Employee Association. It was important that I would that I engaged in activities that were meaningful to me, that expanded my network and helped me stay busy. So for example, with the employee association, it was having some trouble breaking even on its revenue and its expenses. So our post is fairly small and our employee association is very small compared to a lot of other um, embassies. So with my sales background and love for analysis, I volunteered as the president. And in that role, I was able to figure out what was going wrong with our revenue create a plan to bring in a more stable income for the association and the CLO, and then build an inventory system with Microsoft Excel. So I was looking for a skills-based volunteer opportunity and I found it. Um, I was able to contribute to the mission despite not being able to work because of the freeze. I was able to use my professional skills and then expand my network as well. Um, there, it's a double-edged sword being an EFM because you have this amazing opportunity to build your dream career. But what I found is that I had too many ideas and absolutely no focus. So my biggest challenge was prioritizing and focusing. I needed to figure out which projects to pursue and test. So I tried to think about them in terms of profitability and ease of implementation. So what would help me create a career that I can do this week or this month? Um, you can also look at it as affordability of launching and how quickly you can launch. It just depends on what your priorities are and what resources you have. Um, and if you're trying to figure out what career to follow, there are so many ways to generate ideas. You can talk to your global employment advisor, which I actually just did yesterday. Um, you can take career assessment, look at past evaluations from former jobs, um, and jot down anything you're passionate about or that you've loved in the past. Um, I also included opportunities in the mission and in the local economy. I was trying to open myself up to any opportunities possible that would help me build that dream career. Just write it all out in one place, choose the idea that fits your metric or you know, your scale, and then just commit and do it. Um, complete one project to test it out, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, but the biggest thing is just to do it. Um, it's easy to sit back and wait for things to come to you, but the best thing you can do is just complete a project. So it's going to be no surprise. Um, we've already heard it today, but the most rewarding part of self-employment for me is be able, being able to create my own schedule and travel. So although I haven't completely built my dream career yet, um, the goal is to build a career that continues to travel as I do. So being able to work on location remotely or 
work on my projects ahead of time and still vaca still take vacation that aligns with my husband's um, is really valuable to me. It's always been a life goal of mine to travel, so this is one way I can do it. Although I'm still at the beginning of my self-employment, there have been many valuable resources that have helped me. So I bucketed them into two buckets. On the left, you'll see the resources I use to get my first clients. Freelancer and Upwork are both platforms that connect clients with freelancers. So you fill out your profile much like you would a resume or a LinkedIn profile. And then businesses also post their jobs or products. I'll warn you that when you glance through it, you may be thinking it's crazy because there will be jobs that completely undervalue your talent, skills, and time. But if you dig deep enough, there are opportunities there to at least get started. In fact, Upwork is where I found my first client. Actually, she found me. So um, I filled out my profile. Um, after arriving at Post, I got busy in the community and with um, tutoring. And she actually reached out to me. She conducted a Skype interview. And I just really loved her business idea and her in general. So I took her on as a virtual assistant client and have been working with her the past 10 months. Um, the nice thing about Upwork is that it handles all of the payments and time tracking. So if you're not familiar with invoicing or um, not wanting to chase down payments, it's a really great way to get started. After um, landing her as a client, I updated my LinkedIn to reflect my official freelance status. And then within a week, an acquaintance from college messaged me about a freelance opportunity she had um, writing for Hows. So the power of social, social media is real. I know that depending on your business, you may have different platforms, but LinkedIn was very helpful this first tour for me as a self-employed individual. On the right side of the board are resources I have used um, being self-employed. So I definitely track my time, especially with my writing for Hows, just to make sure that I'm continuing to get paid what I deserve for the time I'm taking to write. I use the free website Airtable with a client and for myself to organize ideas, projects, and tasks. Google Sheets has been great for me to track my revenue and expenses because it's online and accessible anywhere. And then finally, TurboTax last year was able to walk me through my self-employment taxes. Um, I hope one day to scale up enough to need Christine and hire someone to help me um, with the more complicated tax um, returns. But so far, TurboTax uh, helped me get started with our dual income. So finally, um, my advice for you if you're considering creating your dream career or a career at home is just to fail fast. So it's that phrase is popular in the tech industry, but I think it's true for a lot of different industries. So as you decide which idea you want to prioritize, start tweaking it, testing it, and improving it. If your idea has legs, you know that you can continue spending time and money to further develop it. Failure is tough, but it can definitely be one of the most valuable experiences as you build your career at home. So you may be wondering how to test your ideas, and I have a few things that I've tried and that I've heard other people try here. The first is creating an MVP, or a minimum viable product. So set up the cheapest, quickest prototype of your idea and begin testing it immediately. Um, use that feedback to really change your product or service and make it better. This can be as simple as a landing page with a video or outline of your product or service. And it's always best to include a field where people can submit their emails so you have beta testers waiting and you have people who are already interested. Um, other affordable ways to test your ideas is with ebooks, blogs, beta testers, there's one of my coworkers, um, and additionally volunteering based on your skills. Um, I, in fact, have had at least seven different blogs throughout my life testing different ideas. Um, one of them you see here, it's a, a blog based on books. The point is, make your idea as tangible as possible, so you can either get ready or move on to your next idea. Um, I'm still in this testing phase, and it's a lot harder to do than it sounds, but when you finish a project, you really get a rush of motivation. You feel like you're moving towards your goal. Um, you get more feedback, and then you continue to get ideas that spark. So good luck on your journey, and I will mute this so you don't have to hear Guinness and take your questions.
Okay, thanks, Morgan. Really, really interesting information. I know that I saw some resources in there that I haven't come across before, so it's really useful. Uh, so, Anna, I'll turn it over to you to recap some of the questions that we've gotten so far. Um, and, great. Um, okay, great. Um, Morgan, one question that was specifically for you was, what is uh, the tool that you use for your time tracker? Um, that's a great question. So I started with um, TimeFlow, which is free. Um, I had some trouble with connectivity, so I now use My Hours. I think it's myhours.com. But if you just Google free time tracker, there are a lot of different trackers that are designed to help you track your time based on project. So any of the articles I write, I have separate trackers for those. And then I can quickly look at a summary of how much time and a certain amount of length of time that I spent on that. Um, another quick question came up of, did you consider working inside the embassy or for an NGO? And if so, what led you away from working with either organization? So um, this story is not unique. I was hired in a position when I arrived at POST in 2016. Um, with this being my first post, I didn't have clearance, so by the time my clearance came in, the freeze was in effect. Um, and I'd actually been hired for two different jobs because I was waiting for one to open up the next summer. Um, so I had considered it. The good news is they exempted my co clo position, so we're just waiting on the final word for that. They exempted the security clearance, so it didn't expire. Um, but I had definitely was planning on working part-time at the embassy just to meet people and get more grounded in the community. Um, and then the tutoring job I took, um, I actually found pretty soon after I got here as well. So it was local economy um, approved by the ambassador and all that fun stuff. But it was a few hours a week working with um, seven to 10 year olds at the French and German school. So I was open to really any opportunity that either got me more involved, helped me network or furthered my skills. I didn't, I wanted to make sure that I was spending my time in a way that would help me build whatever's to come. Thank you. Um, the final question was, what are the resources for gaining or managing new clients? That's a great question. Um, so I've actually been working with Vicki, my global employment advisor, on looking at different clients and remote opportunities. Um, as far as managing, I have two clients, so I haven't had that problem yet. I use Airtable to manage projects, tasks, and to-do lists with one of my clients. Um, I think networking will help me immensely as I try to continue to expand my portfolio um, and grow my client list, but I'm still working through that, so I don't have a great answer for whoever asked. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, are there any more specific questions? I see a question about security, and I believe it has to do with security clearance. If that's the case, I don't think the presenters would be able to answer that. That'd be more specific to your situation. Um, are there any other questions about entrepreneurship? And yes, the copy of the recording will be made available um, after the webinar. Okay, great. And I think that there were a couple questions for Christine, if we uh, we have a couple of minutes to revert back to those. Okay, I'm on. This is one quick question uh, from Vincent, which I think is a great question for everyone since we've been working through our connectivity issues. Um, to all the presenters, do you find that you have some connectivity issues in your host country and how do you address that? Christine, perhaps since you've gone to several different countries, in this role, could you answer that question? Sure. Well, you know, the first time that I had a big connectivity issue was actually during this presentation. <laughs> I lost my sound. Um, so I, you know, it, it, you have to be careful of the internet when you're looking to bid. My, my husband used to tell me that I constrained his career so much because I would get the bed list and I would go through and I'd say, nope, no right to work agreement, nope, no good internet, nope, you know, and I would, I would cross off all the jobs that wouldn't meet my criteria. <laughs> and then I'd give him the rest of the list and he could bid on those. Um, it hasn't hurt him. He's done just fine. But, but that is, we do it together. We co-look at the bid list together. And I know what my business 
me. Um, and I go through and, and make sure that um, wherever we bid, it, it'll I can continue my business. And so connectivity issues are based on what kind of bandwidth you have on your internet, what kind of internet connections you have. And, um, and so I look, I look at those and I research them thoroughly before we even bid on the post. So that being said, it's never perfect. I mean, no matter where you are in the world, it'll cut out sometimes on you. But, um, but you just have to work around that. Great, thank you. Um, Christine, you did have one question. You talked about teleworking and working for different companies back in the US. Um, when do you trigger taxes in the host country? Um, that's a question for me, right, for Christine? Um, so Correct. what I was what I was trying to explain is that um, you need to look at either the bilateral work agreement or the right to work agreement or whatever agreement the State Department has negotiated with your host company. And the flow office can help you with that. Um, and look at what provisions are in there for your ability to work in teleconnect. Okay, so you know you have to get the ambassador approval to work on the local economy. You also have to get it if you're telecommuting or if you're doing your own business in the host country. Um, and so you you need to look and make sure that there are provisions in there. There are some countries that actually won't let you run your own business from that country teleworking. Well, they, they make it more difficult. Like China, for example, I haven't moved there, but I've got clients there who have, who have mentioned some of the challenges with trying to structure their work um, because of the agreements in that country. And so, um, so you do need to be aware that you need to look at that. The general way, and this is general because you do need to look at the specific country, but the general way that you don't trigger taxes in the host country is you, do, you don't exist in the host country as it relates to your business. You do nothing. You don't procure services and you don't provide services. Um, everything that you do is outside of your host country. Um, and so you are telecommuting to your U.S. business and servicing clients. And those clients don't have to be in the U.S. They can be somewhere else in the world. They just can't be in your host country. And so that's kind of the blanket general. But again, I encourage everybody, you need to look at the agreement, um, the agreement that departments negotiated with your host country, assuming that there is one, which there usually is, um, and make sure that you're complying with that. Thank you. Are there any other specific questions for Christine? Okay, great. Thank you so much. And those types of questions are also a great opportunity to reach out to your global employment advisor. Uh, and if you don't um, know their email address, you can also reach out to GEI at state.gov. Um, so it seems like we have finished. We're wrapped up with the questions. Um, thank you so much to Morgan, Luce, and Christine. It was a really wonderful, wonderful hour. And I know I uh, was really appreciative of your time and effort in putting together this webinar. And the Global Employment Initiative team is also very happy to have had the opportunity to work with these great EFMs in putting together a webinar like this. And we really appreciate your time and input. The GEI team has employment advisors that cover all EFMs abroad, as well as a DC-based employment advisor. And we work with EFMs on a broad range of career development services. So please don't hesitate to reach out to your Global Employment Advisor or GEI at state.gov if you'd like any further information. And so as we wrap up, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who called in to today's session. We will be holding three further webinars over the course of the year to hear from EFMs who pursued self-employment in other areas. So please stay tuned for further information regarding dates for those sessions. Let us know if you have any final questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap up today. And we have recorded this session, so please stay tuned for an email from your GEA or your CLO with a link to the recording. And thanks again. Have a wonderful day.